At 32, I find myself settled into the role of an editor at a local women's magazine in Brooklyn, a job that suits my calm and introverted nature perfectly. While others may thrive on bustling social scenes, I prefer the simple pleasures of a quiet evening with a glass of wine and a good book, surrounded by my beloved pets. My social outings are limited to family gatherings or occasional meetups with colleagues and old friends. Recently, my longtime boyfriend Aaron popped the question, marking the culmination of five years together. We celebrated modestly at home, coinciding with the fifth birthday of my niece Alexandra. Wanting to make the day extra special, I organised a gathering in our spacious backyard, complete with inflatables for the kids and a selection of children's literature as a gift for Alexandra, who shares my passion for reading. Despite my reservations, my mother suggested combining the celebrations, hoping it would bridge the gap between my sister Nora and me. We both dismissed the idea initially, knowing the potential for chaos. However, after persistent prodding from my mother and brother, I relented, with the condition that everyone pitch in to clean up afterward. Nora remained sceptical, even attempting to dissuade me from going through with the joint party. However, under pressure from our family's strong Italian heritage, she eventually acquiesced. Weddings and large gatherings are a common affair in our culture, and despite my usual aversion to such events, I've always been embraced by my extended family. Amidst the festivities, my 87-year-old grandmother, battling dementia and health issues, graced us with her presence. Though her communication was limited, her mere presence added a touch of poignancy to the celebration. Despite the chaos, it was a joyous affair, filled with love, laughter and cherished family moments. During the party, Aaron and I found ourselves in the midst of preparing juice for the kids, including my lively nephew Silvio, affectionately known as Evan. When Evan proposed a game of hide-and-seek indoors, I initially hesitated, wary of potential chaos ensuing in my carefully maintained home. However, with some reluctance, I relented, ensuring Aaron secured our drawers and cupboards against any potential mischief. As the children darted around the house, laughter filling the air, the adults congregated in the kitchen and main hall, engaged in cooking and conversation. Suddenly, a piercing scream shattered the jovial atmosphere, prompting me to rush to offer assistance with the first aid kit in hand. It was then that I noticed an eerie silence had descended, a telltale sign of mischief brewing. Hurrying to investigate, I discovered the children attempting to construct a makeshift ladder to reach the baseball bats atop a bookshelf. Before I could intervene, the ladder collapsed with a cacophony of shouts, causing the bookshelf to groan ominously under the strain. Desperately, I struggled to support it, but the weight proved too much until Aaron rushed to my aid. Amidst the chaos, the keys to the cupboard were lost, a minor detail overshadowed by the looming disaster. Despite our best efforts, the keys remained elusive, prompting us to reluctantly rejoin the party, leaving the issue unresolved. However, my apprehensions proved valid when I later heard Evan tampering with the cupboard lock, a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of children's antics. I told Nora to go check on the kids after she was finished eating, but she grew snarky. She started lecturing me about what it means to be a mother and how taxing it can be for children if they are not given some independence. My personal dog, Henry, a Rottweiler, began barking at the youngsters. Henry does not bite. The charming idiot is afraid of loose cotton. He was probably barking to keep the kids away because he knows I dislike having people touch it. I didn't want to make a scene so I let it go until I saw my brother enter the room and begin yelling at Evan. I attempted to calm everyone down, but one thing led to another, and there was now a fight between my brother, Anthony, and Nora about yelling at Evan. This was an unneeded drama that I did not enjoy or believe was acceptable to have in front of the children and their parents. When our parents intervened, the conflict subsided. 
I was just doing my best to look after the house and interacted minimally with the conversation about their son stealing the key. But after the party, when I began searching, I discovered that my ring was missing. My grandmother gave me the ring. She had passed down a family heirloom to me and it was gone after the party turmoil. It was stored in the same cupboard Evan was opening. I quickly contacted his house and inquired, but he replied that when the shouting began, he lost it somewhere. Well, I was devastated. I found the key but misplaced my treasured ring. So I began ranting at his wife for not immediately checking on their child's theft. My brother said it was her fault, but blaming others won't get the ring back. I was outraged and hung up the phone, informing him and his family that they would never step foot in my life again. They damaged it sufficiently. My aunt called to attempt to calm me down, but she did not support Alicia's position. See, everyone in our family knew how much the ring meant to us. Nobody knew how old the ring was, and my grandmother inherited it from her great-aunt. They didn't even pawn it when they moved to America in the late 1800s, since it was regarded as a lucky charm. When I was 18, I received it from my grandma, much to the envy of everyone. I battled with my mother because she was forcing us into a combined party. Though I apologized later, I believed that if she hadn't insisted on a double party, none of this would have happened. Growing up, I was a sick child. I had asthma and had to frequently miss school and stay at my grandmother's house because both of my parents worked. All of my childhood recollections come from that dreary, yellow-painted cottage in the suburbs of New Jersey. I had to be homeschooled, and my grandmother worked as a principal at a local school before retiring. So I learned practically everything from her, and she influenced my values, confidence, and problem-solving mentality. I adore her, and even after I was well enough to attend school, I spent every weekend at her home. My grandfather died before I was born. Therefore, my mother felt lonely in that house until my birth. On my 18th birthday, I was accepted into my dream institution, Cornell University, to pursue my bachelor's degree in English. And I was so delighted and thrilled. But I realized I wouldn't be able to see her often enough. At this point, she was diagnosed with early onset dementia. I was afraid that my loving Nana, my grandmother, would forget me if I went away to college. I broke down and cried in front of my father while extremely inebriated. This was my first drink and I was underage. They simply left me off at her house and informed her of my problem because they were unable to persuade me. The next morning, I awoke to her sitting alongside me, stroking my hand. She grinned and instructed me to get ready quickly. Then we went to my parents' house and she gave me a ring and said, I may forget your face, but I'll never forget that. I won't forget you, sweetie. Keep it secure. I'll now hand over this obligation to you. It is yours. And no one, absolutely no one, can take it away from you. Oh, this was the nicest gift anyone could have ever given me. Even Aaron understood not to meddle with it. And now I've lost it because of another person's negligent youngster. However, I was persuaded that something was fishy. Aaron and I searched our entire house for this ring, but were unsuccessful. It almost seemed to appear and then go. I was heartbroken, but life continued. Aaron, witnessing this, went out and had a similar looking ring created. He had seen it enough and there were enough images of it. So the designer did his best to reproduce the rings with identical metals. He surprised me with it and it was bittersweet. It looked similar to the original ring but felt different and seeing it reminded me of how I had lost a family relic. This situation took a turn. I ran across an old college acquaintance named Jade. Jade is a pediatrician who recently moved to New York. We caught up on our lives and I informed her that I had lost the ring. She was sad at first, but then mentioned that she had seen a similar ring on mother who had visited her clinic last week. I joked that the ring must have become tired and found a new bearer. 
similar to the Lord of the Rings myth. But she was insistent. She couldn't recall the client's name. So I told her to SMS me the information in case she saw the woman again. At this point, I'd given up on the ring. I unofficially invited her to my wedding in December before leaving. And I gave her my new phone number. I received a call a few weeks later, informing me that the woman with the ring was at her clinic. I told her that I was in my office and couldn't leave since the rings looked similar. But then she told me the woman's name was Nora Zampone. I was stunned and asked her the name of the child. My mind was racing and frantic, and as soon as I heard Evan's name, I told her to give me her clinic address. Then I left the office and called Aaron and my mother. I informed my mother that if this were true, I would strangle Nora. This prompted her to call Anthony as well, and the four of us were heading to the paediatrician at 2 p.m. m. On a Wednesday, I approached the clinic and confronted Nora. We got into a screaming battle in the parking lot, and Jay was taken aback when she saw me screaming at a complete stranger. She denied it was my Nana's ring and claimed it was something her husband had given her. Aaron, weary, had to separate us as my mother and Anthony escorted her away. I was still pretty angry, you know. I knew she was wearing my ring because she avoided exposing it to me. The disappointment of the previous two weeks had twisted into a blank hatred. My parents attempted to calm me down and bargain with me. They promised me Nora would return the ring if it proved to be mine. They requested an intervention at their home, where everything would be decided. I screamed at my mother for inciting all of this with her version of the party at my place. Grace, it is not my fault if you are unable to protect your valuables. I've had so many major gatherings at our house and nothing has ever been stolen or lost. Now it's fine, just get home around noon. Well, sure, a rage began to rise within me. And I rashly replied, you didn't have to manipulate a sister-in-law who stole from you now, did you? Oh, she was envious and irritated by my relaxed lifestyle. My brother married a monster and now I have to endure. It turned out that the phone was on speaker and my brother, who had come to tell them about the event, had heard everything. So Anthony and I clashed over the phone, which resulted in my mother taking the phone from him and ending the call. Aaron consented to accompany me. And as we arrived at the gate, there was already cursing that could be heard along the street. We got into an already ongoing fight, trying to figure out what was causing it. You gave her everything. You did not care for your own son or his family. I battle for him and your grandkids, who will continue on your legacy. Nora stated, I understood everything I had at this point. She was jealous. When I was 11, I had a severe asthma episode and was hospitalized. My parents were worried for my life since they couldn't pay the medical bills. So my aunt and grandmother both chipped in to donate a substantial sum of money, half of which was never spent. They wanted me to have it either way. Nora often commented on how my family supported me in every risk I took in life. The intervention didn't go well. The fight became increasingly heated to the point when my brother intervened and demanded that all assets be shared equally. This made my mother cry and she began cursing at me for causing this scene and having her kid dislike her. This upset me even more, and I angrily assaulted Nora, bringing up their marital scandal. This was a sensitive subject, and I felt as if I was cutting the tension with a knife. I didn't care. I stopped caring when my brother, who knew it was my ring, began defending his wife. After he informed me that I should have died in the hospital at 11 o'clock instead of stealing everything he owned. I went home to calm down and Aaron brought some Chardonnay and we sat silently and drank until midnight. I sat all night contemplating how far I wanted to push this. Was it truly necessary for me to preserve a connection if my own mother turned against me? I wish my grandmother was still her old self. She would stop these morons so quickly, and in the morning, I received a call from my aunt, Victoria. She had heard about the fight from my mother 
and called to make sure I didn't take any severe actions. My aunt on my mother's side was well off. She married a real estate magnate and was quite generous with her money. You see, she was an excellent psychologist. She studied criminal psychology and forensic science in college. She also served as an analyst for the United States Army during the Afghan War. I idolized her because I aspired to be a well-read, powerful lady like her. Even my grandma was impressed with her, and we used to joke about how my father married the quieter of the sisters. My aunt wanted to handle things at her house without Nora, so she invited just me and my brother to La. I told her I didn't think the conclusion would alter and was considering suing her. My aunt chuckled and told me that nothing of the sort would be required. We visited her place in Nalai. And when the talk began, it was cordial, but rapidly went passive-aggressive, with my brother playing the same tune as Nora, pointing out how I was well off and did not need the ring. And the most ridiculous thing was that he requested monetary compensation for returning the ring. Even my aunt was surprised to hear this because she, like everyone else, knew the ring was mine. Now I had to pay a ransom to get it back from my own brother's wife, who had stolen it, and I walked away, threatening him with a lawsuit for theft, fraud, and extortion. He laughed at me before telling me to go ahead. I flew back home and thought for a while, and they were convinced that I would not make this a public issue by becoming engaged with the court. I wanted to break it, so I filed the complaint against them. First, Nora was charged with theft and Anthony with fraud for requesting a ransom, and I even stored the ring in a bank locker several times for safekeeping. Wow, to be honest, I had all of the necessary paperwork to confirm it was mine and was about to leave my residence. My mother called to tell me that my grandmother had passed away. This put the whole thing on a somber note. And for the first time in what felt like years, the entire family gathered to mourn. However, the sparks continued to fly, causing more than just a fire. Now that my grandma has died, my mother has persuaded me to let go of the ring for the sake of family peace. Even my father assured me that this is what my grandmother would have wanted if she were still alive. Nora stood behind them all, waiting to see whether I would give in. And my brother even apologised for demanding the money and being so harsh. But the harm was done. Nobody can take back the words they spoke as I told them. If they wanted harmony in the family, I'd need the ring returned. And it is exactly what my grandmother would have wanted. Without being able to resolve it as mediators, they eventually left it up to Nora to persuade me. After all of the disputes and terrible memories of death that had occurred in the last few days of Nana's life, she began by claiming she loved Nana as much as I did and did not want to ruin her legacy. And I don't recall what she said after that, because I knew it would not be worth listening to. I returned home, waited for a few weeks, and then filed my allegations. My brother called, enraged, and accused me of wrecking a nice family and house because of a child's intransigence. I encouraged him to look at his wife before making such charges about me and to never contact me directly again because we were officially on opposite sides. My mother called me crying and berating me, telling me the same things Anthony did and that my grandmother would have abandoned me if she had known about my conduct. My aunt, on the other hand, inquired if I needed some decent lawyers and assured me that her husband was also on my side. According to the official court testimony, Nora said that I gave her the ring at the party because my grandmother had requested it, but then changed her story after her death. My brother supported her statements and disputed the ransom, stating it was a joke. I started everything here in detail, and I recall everything. No one will go unpunished. Today in court, Evan stated that he never removed the ring from the cupboard and was seeking chocolate. I knew she coerced him into telling this, but I also felt sorry for the poor child. That kid is lying solely to protect his mother, without realising the brutality of society and the law. Following the court session, I met Layla, Nora's sister, outside. 
and I expected her to be nasty at first, but she asked me to meet her at a nearby Starbucks in an hour. I refused, assuming it was another meeting to persuade me to drop the case and compromise. But she insisted on meeting with me. When I arrived, she made it clear that she was not there to persuade or argue, but to simply assist me. It became known that Nora had stolen from a family member before. Nora's parents practically abandoned her after a disastrous marriage, and I had no idea what was going on. Since, you know, my folks were really quiet about it. Wow, Layla. Nora was engaged to another man before meeting Anthony, and she had planned a lavish wedding. However, her fiancé and she couldn't agree on the wedding details, so they fought a lot. He also travelled and was found by Nora using a burner phone to conceal another relationship rather than addressing him. She began cheating on Anthony as well. And Anthony had no idea Nora was engaged until he discovered it and confronted her. She cried and told him about her fiancé, who would not allow her to break up with him. So Anthony argued with her fiancé, and Nora told him she had to marry anyway or her family would be upset. So my foolish brother was tricked into marrying her before he was ready. But her parents discovered the truth and severed all connections. Layla, feeling guilty, even stepped in to assist them in rebuilding a family. But Nora had removed the jewellery Layla had received from their parents. When challenged, she justified and claimed that Layla was at least in communication with their parents and may obtain a portion of the jewellery. Layla, not wanting to interrupt her little sister, obliged and calmed down. After Evan was born, her parents softened and consented to accepting her back into the family after some coaxing from Layla. Nora initially denied wanting any relationship and even barred them from ever seeing their grandchild. They apologised and gave her gifts when she agreed, but she immediately began guilt-tripping them for not having her wedding. This irritated her mother and they eventually gave them a large portion of the land they owned in Romania. Her parents are quite wealthy, and these presents angered Layla because she was essentially taking her parents' jewellery and future possessions. But she let it go because she didn't want to see her family disintegrate again. Layla informed me she was willing to testify fully, and she was weary of being messed over by her jealous and stubborn sister. When I notify my lawyer about this, she was overjoyed. This story may establish a fake character, which would sway the jury in their favour. I'm feeling quite positive about winning the case right now, especially now that Nora's own sister has joined my side. This situation with Nana will, um, come to light in court soon. When we see Nana's will, um, now I've won. Nana's will was read in court yesterday. It stated unequivocally that I would own the ring as well as the sum of $120,000. So her allegation about transferring the ring would be hearsay and could not be verified by anyone. Even medical examiners and our family doctor questioned if my grandma was in a mental state to make such logical remarks at the time. Layla then submitted her statement and added it to the lawsuit, along with new proof demonstrating her absolute false character. The council requested that the allegations be filed separately, as they were unrelated. Nora also stated in court today that she had lost the ring in her home. The police were instructed to investigate and locate the ring, as it was a source of controversy. Our council stated that Nora had engaged in repeated deceptive behaviour, which was legally allowed until the case was filed, and would have to continue to do so if they weren't. Our next date is in a week, and my hopes are fading little by little. I'm concerned Nora will lead the police and the court on a big goose chase to discover the stuff she took, and I'll never see the ring again, even if I win the case. So, following the court session, I met with her parents, who apologised for the trouble their pampered daughter was bringing to my family. I told them it wasn't their responsibility anymore, because my parents and brother encouraged it. This was the result of that. My father found me in the office today and was acting bashful. He felt awful for me and understood I was doing the right thing. 
no matter how difficult it was. He told me he was happy to have raised a fighter who would not back down from an illness or a person. My mother was also seemingly depressed. She supported Nora, but was too proud to admit so. I felt sorry for them. This was never their fight, but they were dragged in because they did not want their children to be ridiculed in society. He promised. If he ever found the ring, he promised to steal it for me. And I laughed and agreed to pay him a bounty if he did. The case's verdict came today after two months of several investigations. The ring that Nora had lost was discovered after prolonged searching. It turns out Anthony knew the house would be carefully examined and any traces of digging would cause the team to request authorization to excavate the land as well. Because their actions were being constantly observed by the cops, one of Anthony's friends came home as usual and slipped the ring into his sock before leaving. He intended to make more such visits and Anthony and his buddies had discussed starting their own factory prior to the incident. As a result, the visits were not scrutinised since officials were certain that the scheme was legitimate. The friend then ran away to his Texas ranch. Investigators discovered the evidence when searching Anthony and Nora's cell phones for suspicious messages. Nothing came up until the cops checked for all numbers with the name Anthony. And they discovered a burner phone from which he transmitted the messages. Following the evidence's submission to the court, the couple pleaded guilty to all charges, claiming they were doing so to solve their, quote, financial problems. The judge sentenced them to one year in county jail and imposed a $2,000 fine. Layla and I will each receive $1,000. Following the recovery of the stolen goods, the judge found them not guilty of ransom or significant deception. They could apply for bail in six months, so they were going to pay their way out anyhow. But the humiliation on Nora's face was to die for. I never wanted my brother to go to jail, but because he was technically a co-conspirator and helped her hide, he had to be sentenced as well. My mother sat in silence, visibly distraught, while my father cast a sorrowful glance across the courtroom. In contrast, Layla wore a triumphant expression, reveling in her victory over her sister, a battle she had never before fought, especially not in such a public setting. The taste of triumph was sweet, yet laced with bitterness, a sentiment that resonated with me deeply. Amidst this whirlwind of emotions, egos clashed and futures hung in the balance, particularly for Ivan and Alexandra, Innocent bystanders caught in the crossfire of familial discord. Aaron approached me, expressing his fondness for Evan's lively energy, prompting me to agree to care for the children, if their parents allowed it. Summoning my courage, I made the offer to my mother, even ensuring Nora, my sister, overheard my proposal. Though I stood up for myself, I couldn't shake the guilt weighing on me for jeopardizing my brother's career and my nephew's future all for the sake of a ring, a memento of my grandmother. Yet their disrespect toward her memory ultimately led to their downfall. Meanwhile, Layla's parents stepped forward, offering to care for both children, a solution I believe Nora will accept, unaware of my behind-the-scenes negotiations. Their support is more practical, considering both Aaron and I hold demanding jobs. Amidst the aftermath, my aunt Victoria offered her congratulations, acknowledging the bitter victory that had been won. Reflecting on the day's events, my aunt imparted valuable wisdom, reminding me of the importance of fighting for oneself, even in the face of adversity. As we shared drinks at a nearby tavern, she opened up about her own life's trials and tribulations, offering a poignant lesson. While we may achieve temporary victories by testing others' patience and boundaries, true triumph lies in mutual respect and understanding. Returning home to a quiet house, with dinner laid out and Aaron already retired to bed, I couldn't help but ponder the lessons learned and the challenges still ahead.